very simple thoughts with you. And from what I've heard, I believe you are all believers. So I'm not looking at new people that are visiting a church for the first time or hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. Is there anyone who needs Italian translation, by the way? I don't know. Don't think so. Okay. So my wife is saying, the service, she had volunteered to go back, and there is simultaneous translation equipment with the earphones. If you'd like, uh, open your Bibles now. We'll read the text in a few moments. Well, let's go ahead and read it now. So you'll understand better what the title is of the sermon. Isn't this the carpenter? And actually, I forgot to make you one correction. We're going to read Mark 6 from 1 to verse 6, not just 1 to verse 5. I thought I'd made all the corrections this week on PowerPoint, but I guess I had. Isn't this the carpenter? So let's go ahead and read, and I'm using the New International English Version. You may have other New Living Translation or your own uh, native language. Jesus left there. Where had he been? If you look and see where he had been, he had uh, healed the dead, and raised the dead girl. He had, uh, that was Jairus' daughter, if you remember. And he had healed the lady with the hemorrhage of blood. And I'm going to make reference to that later. But here he goes and he moves on. And Jesus goes back toward his hometown. Jesus left there where he had been. And went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. What was his hometown? Do you remember? Nazareth. 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 He was born in, in Bethlehem. But his hometown was Nazareth where he was raised. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who had heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that he's been given him? That he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Ah, we see the text now and the title. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives in his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except laying his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at the lack of now, if I look at that last phrase, I could preach a message on that, but that would be very negative. Their lack of faith. Do we lack faith? I want us to have faith and have our faith build up. Now, in our Western world, the individual arts, artisans, uh, people who make things with their hand, I love the uh, gelato artigianale. Uh, that's the one they make. If you find one of this, have a scoop at least once a day. <laughs> at least once a day. Now forget the diet. So when you're in the market or in this homemade ice cream. And the, the way of making things with their hands on the natural course, you're the leather that you're famous in Florence and so many other things as well. Commercialism and in mass and quick repairs or even replacements are her. I remember the first time I brought my opal into a shop in Germany. And I, I said, could you adjust my clutch for me? And by the way, I had a good day. The man running the, that department was a Dutchman who spoke perfect English, so I didn't have any problem. And he became a very good friend of mine as long as I had that local car. He said, we don't repair clutches, we change clutches. And I remember when you, know, you adjusted things and you, you made them last as long as they possibly could. Shoe repairs and mechanics. We upholstery furniture. We pay, you don't repair a TV anymore, you throw it away. Or a, or, 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 or a, a, a phone, you know, a German we call handies, uh, little portable phones, like cellular phones. Other electronics. They're no longer here. They're done away with. Carpenters in the time of Christ were not just wood workers. You're going to see some pictures here, like this one here, as you go along here. Working wood is, is an art, and finishing wood is an art, and all the things that take place in doing that. All was formed and shaped by an artisan. 
you have to pay thousands of euros or dollars or wherever you're from if you want homemade furniture today. I mean, thousands if not tens of thousands of dollars. Because it's fine hand work. Or if it's not, oh, I don't even know how to say it in English, but you know, that corrugated wood or the type of thing, you know, if you want solid oak furniture, you're going to pay a lot of wood. And, and probably it's worked by hand or by machines that are, are very specialized in this. All is shaped. Now, Jesus was chosen by his father to be able, his earthly father, to be able to learn the art of being a carpenter. Now, the mother did all that, the basic teachings in the first four years. And if they could, they could send the boys at least to school within their culture. And they're in Nazareth. But in society, it was the father who then taught the child trade. Now, there's another stark fact, tradition, just by way of background of what we read, is that Nazareth was near a, and tradition tells us this from Jewish background and history, there was a town near Nazareth that had been destroyed. And so it took many artisans that worked not only wood, but worked metal and, and worked stone in order to do the jobs that were needed. So it says that Jesus was a carpenter. Isn't this a carpenter? Because they identified him with Joseph. So probably they had plenty of work to do because Jesus doesn't appear again until the temple, and then we don't know anything about his teen years until he starts his ministry. Now, Jesus became the master carpenter. So what do we have here? What does a carpenter do? I want you to remember three things today. And to make it easy for you, they all start with the letter F. First thing he does, he fashions. Jesus fashions. Now, to fashion means to create or to build. And we think immediately the potter, back in Jeremiah, I think it was chapter 18, he took the clay and put it on the wheel. Have you ever watched one of those artisans do that? And he goes to places that do it, like blowing glass. If you go to Venice, any of you, you see how they blow the glass. That's artisanship. And they fashion things out of things you wouldn't even believe that could possibly be done with what they have. And God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. And to give you a future and a hope. So God knows exactly what you and I need. Even when we become kind of desperate, we can't find a house. We don't feel like we have enough money. The job's not what we expected. We're going to talk about some of these things in the next few moments. And we are beautifully and wonderfully made, it says in Psalm 139, verse 14. I give thanks to you, the psalmist says, for I am fearfully and beautifully made. Fashioning. Now let me stop here to start an illustration which I will take you through two or three different times in the next few moments. That's making shoes. Uh, when I had, when my parents were pastoring in the States for five years and then returned to Italy to stay until they retired, they had that break that they did not expect. They thought they were only in the States a year. But dad was asked to pastor a church and he did. They needed help. But when they knew they were coming back, they weren't going to be able to get back till Christmas. So they said, if you don't mind, there were some friend, Italian friends of ours visiting the States, raising funds to build the Bible College, which is in Rome and today, because of funds that were raised in America. They said, would you mind going back? And they said, well, what? we would love to take your son back. I already knew one of the families ever since I was four years old, from four to eight years old, and, and, and I still spoke Italian. Would you mind going back to start the school year? We'll be there by Christmas. They never came till April. <laughs> So you send a 12, 13-year-old boy to live with a family who you haven't seen in five years, even though you knew them. Uh, my parents did risky things that my wife and I would never do to our kids. But I would, and, and while I, when I would get out of school, until I get into the high school, I was in the middle school, after school I would get home with the bus, and then I'd catch a, 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 a rolling bus, I lived in Rome, and it was one of these electric buses, and go downtown where the father of the household, who was like a grandfather of me, was even back then, he was in his 50s, and he would, he was a, he was a, a shoe repairman, a cobbler in English, a shoe repairman, outside. 
And it, in fact, the name on the store was, for those of you who were living there, you know, Il Mio Calzolario, my shoe repair lady, my cobbler. And I watched him by the hours. And then, of course, you don't eat dinner in Rome until 9 o'clock at night. And he didn't close the shop until about 8. And then we took the bus home together and had supper. And I would do some homework for my dad and and so on. And, and I watched him take a piece of leather. And I watched him lay it out. And I watched him cut it out. And, and back then, not many people could afford to buy shoes. It was cheaper to have them made for you. And some people had strange shapes of feet. And his own son was that way. He had these wooden shapes of foot that he would then add to and cut away from to make it if he had a high instep or low or flat-footed or whatever. And I just watched him do all this. And it was so amazing how he did that. We'll talk more about it in a few moments. But when he talks about fashioning, God not only has plans for us, not only does he make us the way we are, I look around here, we're different nationalities, we're different colored skin, we're different backgrounds. Uh, we, I'm glad we all don't look the same. He probably looked at me and said, I'm glad I don't have his nose. That has a good Italian nose, you know, I'm a good Italian profile. But then look at my wife, she's, she, I wasn't born in there, she's born in there. She's like, tiny nose, not like you just chew on it sometimes. <laughs> But when, when God fashions us, he is, see, he's covered. It's, it's God working in us. And I love this scripture out of Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, and I'm going to read it from two translations. The first one is the New American Standard Bible, which is, they say, is one of the most correct for the original. So then, my beloved, Paul is writing to the Philippian church, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, it's easy to obey God in your church, but not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is, now here's the verse I want to highlight, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work of his good pleasure. Amen. So God takes the initiative. Now here's the living Bible. I've never found one I like better than this one. And we don't, even in English, we don't use the Living Bible that much anymore because there's a New Living Translation. But this is a little different than the New Living Translation. For God is at work within you, helping you want to obey, and then helping you do what he wants. Now, in American English, we have a nice little phrase called, it's a win-win situation. You can't lose. Why? Because... First it says, he's going to help you obey, and then, he, no, and then he's going to help you do what he wants you to be obedient and do. So it's a double winner. God's working in your life, and you may not understand, why did God put me here? Why am I on this trip? Why am I here for a month? God, what do you have for me next? Well, we pray for your direction. For God's direction for you. Because God wants to do something in our life. It is a constant work in progress. And in the beginning of Philippians, for chapter 1, verse 6, it said, He who begins a good work, will, I don't have it on the notes, will bring it to completion. He's doing it for what is best for us, even though we don't always understand. I had to work on that with cultural change. I had to work on it when I went to Germany. I had to work on it now that I come back to Italy. Oh, Germany was so much more quiet. Germany was so much more clean. <laughs> Germany is so much more orderly. <laughs> Germany has so much less bureaucracy and paperwork. Well, I had like to do it, and that, that's hard to do. But God it does it for a purpose, to teach us something. Unless we were like the people who says, God is trying to work first patience in your heart. And so we say, oh, Lord, I want patience. And I want it right now. <laughs> it is a constant work. Let's ask ourselves, what is God trying to do in my life? What is God trying to say? Am I giving him the freedom to do his work? Here from Philippians 2.13. And Paul says it to the Galatians, to the Galatians, Till Christ be formed in you. Galatians, uh, Galatians 4.19. But oh my dear children, 
I feel I am going to labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully formed and developed in your life. God's not finished with us. He's trying to do it. There was a, a Bible teacher in the States by the name of Bob Mumford. He's still alive, but he's an older man now. And I remember he influenced my life. Because he said, we better be careful. If we don't obey when God is trying to shape us into something, to fashion us, then he only has two choices. And the two choices that he has is to show us through revelation, that's showing us. That's what he'd like to do. And he shows us that through scripture, through prayer, through whatever, through gifts of the spirit. Or if we don't obey the revelation that God shows us what he wants to do, he's going to send in the bulldozer. <laughs> this one. What does the bulldozer do? Big piece of ground full of trees and bushes and somebody bought it. They want to build a house or a store or a business. The bulldozer comes in and uproots everything. You know, sometimes the bulldozer in our life may be needed by the house. Just a little bit. But why do we have to wait for the bulldozer? Why don't we accept the revelation? And we could go on, but there's much more here. Second thing, the second half is not only he fashions, we go moving along faster here. He fixes. He fixes. And that's what a shoe repairman does as well. He fixes. Again, today, we rarely find a place because, did you notice that the shoes, my shoes, can't fix those, <laughs> throw them away. All one piece of rubber under me. They used to have heels that you substituted the little rubber part on the back of the heel. Remember those kind of shoes? <laughs> now, if you buy two or three hundred euro shoes, they still do that. Those big name shoes, you know, that they sell in the high rankings. And only people who make a lot, a lot of money can buy those kind of shoes, maybe. And they're a little leather, you never see rubber on those shoes, except a little deal with them. And sometimes maybe even just a corner of it is rubber. And that can be fixed. Well, back to the shoe shop. I watched how he put, it was all leather back then. They could put a thick strata for the winter of rubber on it for rain and and insulation, because many of the homes back then in Rome in 1959 and 60 did not have central heating. And they could glue that on, but it didn't last real well. And they could take that off and then regrind the leather under it for spring and then refinish it again. But when he fixes, nothing is impossible for God to fix. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at, at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is all Jesus was called to do. And when we read what it says he came to do in Luke uh, 4, verse 18 and 19, I'm not going to read all of it, but the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, for he has appointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the, the, the freedom for the captives that will be released, and, and the blind that will see, and the downtrodden will be freed, and all of these things. Jesus knew when he come to fix people's lives. That was the key challenge is all about. Fixing the lives of people. That's what the church is about. It's a spiritual hospital. And notice that he will fix relationships. He will heal memories. I know Pastor Bill, teaches Johnson teaches a lot of these things. He mends shattered spirits. He restores broken bodies. He is constantly at our side through the Holy Spirit in all our circumstances because he wants to do the things that are needed. And in 1 Peter 5, 10, after you have suffered a little while, notice that little, after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you and will place you on a firm foundation. The last of the three F's. Well, he fashions, he fixes, he finishes. He always finishes the job he's doing. I don't know where you're at in the Christian walk. I don't know what you're going through now, decision making. Some of you, I didn't ask, but some are from the family, 
here or elsewhere, as you told us in the States, and your children. Uh, some are single, but they God has a purpose and a plan for your life, and He's not finished with you yet. And that's what's important. He finishes completing me, beautifying, preserving. And you know, before the shoes left the shop from the when he got to finishing the soles, you know what he did? I wish I could show you. I'm not going to take my shoes off. I did take a shower for that time. I'm not going to take my shoes. Around the edge of the sole, let's say that's the sole. That's the leather. This part of the leather is the part that's hitting the shoe. But the bottom part, he would go around with a knife. And my father-in-law, who's 91 and still has, has one of these in his drawer, had a special knife, so sharp, and it was almost like a razor blade. He'd, he'd go around and about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half, if you can measure and they all did by eye. They cut all around the sole a flap of about a half to a, a centimeter to a centimeter and opened it up. And that's where the stitching went. If you wear shoes today, even the 300, 500 euro shoes, where you can see the stitching, that's a bad job. Because as you walk, it's going to wear. No, it was opened up. And I saw them stitch, and they had a special iron that made a hole from the inside. And, and, and the cord they used, a special wax cord, they pulled it through and then back another hole. Just like when you're still sewing by hand. I don't know how you use a sewing machine. So I do repair some of my own things sometimes when my wife's not available or it doesn't. And we're watching, I'm watching. Uh, and I can <laughs> see how the stitching in and out and back and forth. You know, I move the buttons over. It's, got a little tight on my shirt, so I can't get my tie in the button cloak. I'll do that myself. And it's interesting how, and then if they will close that flap with glue, and the glue, you put it on and you let it sit for 10 minutes, then you pound it down with a hammer. It's not finished yet. They go around with hot wax and seal when they close. Can you imagine this? God finished, wants to finish the job in our lives. Whether it's an illness, my wife is a cancer survivor. I don't think the job's totally finished yet because she has some after effects of the chemo, but she's been totally clean for seven or eight years. And yeah. praise God for that. Yeah. The finishing of it all. God finishes it. He's in the process and they rub it out. They smooth it out. They restore. They refine. And it may hurt sometimes going through the process. He does not need his work being complete, as I quoted earlier, Philippians 1 6, but I had it down here. We are his handiwork, it says in Ephesians, his workmanship, for we are God's workmanship. The New Living Translation says his masterpiece, yes. created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has something prepared for each one of us to do in our life if we will do it. He had a work prepared for me that I didn't want to do. The team challenge. And now, that's my wife. Team challenge is our heart. No matter what else I'm going to do. But we go to the conference almost every year. And next, this next year, I'm going to send a bulletin to the pastor here. It will be in Rimini, Italy. It's an all Europe conference. And they come from Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And it's phenomenal. So God wants to finish the work in us. His house or workshop, be careful. We're beginning to close here. His workshop is not for keeping broken pieces or secondhand pieces. It is not an antique shop. You're not an antique to God. I don't care how you're a long little from here. So I'm an antique. <laughs> he wants us to be used, sent out, and be busy for him. It is not always orderly. There are damaged pieces, like the drug addicts, like the alcohol. How about the sexually abused? Some by relatives, some growing up, some at home, some outside on the streets. The broken homes, the bulimic, the anorexic. God's in the business of taking care of all of that. It's not a museum that is quiet or still or just for show. God is taking care of us completely to complete the work that he has started because that's what he means to do. Therefore, we 
we are still in the work process. Whether fractions, or fixes, or finishes. Now, what do we do? Always got to tell you, we need to do something. God doesn't do it alone because we have three rules. We must choose. Do we want to choose God's way? Do we want to choose this way, this, the Bible, or do we want to do it our way? We had a family in our church, one of the churches we were involved in. We were just being interim pastors. We didn't know what we were going to inherit during that time. But that family was a mess. I, I don't want to go into detail, but there was immorality on the part of one of the parents. And there was immorality with one of the other relatives. And my wife was trying to teach some young people in that church. It was a mess. Well, that's not wrong. My aunt does that, or my uncle does that, or my this, or my that. And I know that my one of my parents is on the other parent. They were in church and they, they professed to be the song ones. And you need to choose to obey God's word. Jesus said, this is my commandments, but you will be blessed if you do them. If you don't do them, it doesn't work. If I don't do what the doctor says, I'm not going to get better. Unless you change, of course. We must be open and honest with ourselves. Open and honest with ourselves. Are you willing to open up? You may need to talk with your lady, you talk to Pastor Diane. You may need to talk with your man, Pastor Randy. I don't know. We need to be transparent. We must learn to turn it over to Jesus, the great carpenter. And we can't do that unless we're willing to be open. And we must let him fashion fix. Let me suggest four other words at the very conclusion. It all starts with the same letter. I like alliteration. I remember the needs here. Recognize what the problem is. Have I got a problem? Do I recognize it? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it gambling? Is it this? Is it that? Is it everything? Is it lying? Second, once I recognize it, I've got to realize there's an answer. God's Word is, has the answers. Jesus has the answers. And the Holy Spirit, who lives in me, has of salvation. He wants to be the children of the day. Then I have to release it. Let it go. So many people want to hang on to their own